Welcome to a new series of Coonrod's Corner videos, the real world of RF printed circuit boards. Today's topic, basic PCB design guidelines for microwave and millimeter wave applications. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, my name is John Coonrod with Rogers Corporation. I am a technical marketing manager and today I'm going to be talking to you about basic guidelines of printed circuit boards and how to design them to where you get the uh, optimum results out of RF designs at uh, microwave and millimeter wave frequencies. Now this is a really big topic and uh, I'm only going to give you highlights here and I'd invite you to, to go to our Rogers Technology Support Hub and get more information on some of the subjects I'm talking about today. As well, there's another video that was made and uh, that video's title is What RF Engineers Need to Know About PCB Fabrication for Optimal Results. And in that video, uh, it talks about a lot of the terms and technology that leads up to this video. So it's best to watch that video before watching this one, and you can click on the link to do that. So here we're going to be talking about um, how, the, uh, how the PCB design itself can impact RF performance in ways that RF engineers may not suspect. And this usually happens when you have RF engineers that are uh, less savvy with some of the PCB technology or maybe not understand how circuits are built. And uh, they may design something that will cause the fabricator to build it in a different way than what the RF designer had in mind. And because of that, uh, they might get a different response out of the actual circuit that's built, even though their simulation of models are showing them something else. So there's some disconnect there between the theory of RF design and then the practical implement implementation of that using printed circuit board technology. And that's really what I'm going to try to address today. Now for Rogers, on our tech support hub, you'll find that we also have uh, uh, TSEs, which are technical support engineers, and they support the fabricators directly in circuit fabrication, and they can certainly talk to you and help you understand uh, some of the things in circuit fabrication and more details uh, about that for a particular design you're looking at. We also have ADMs, Application Development Managers. Now they help the RF designers uh, kind of uh, piece together the puzzle, you might say, between the practical aspects and the RF design itself. So either one of these groups are very supportive of our customers, and I invite you to reach out to them. Shown in this graphic is a table of information, and it is subjective, but it's just really to give the RF designer uh, somewhat of a thought process on the different RF structures that can be used and how these different RF structures will have uh, different RF performances. So just an example, uh, let's look at microstrip, uh, the first row there. And if you go over to, I think, the seventh column, wideband dispersion, most RF engineers are going to tell you that microstrip is dispersive, so that's what I mean by poor under the category of uh, wideband dispersion. Microstrip is poor for having dispersion. And then granite coplanar waveguide, I've uh, put that as good, and you could probably rate that even excellent, depending on the design of the granite coplanar waveguide. Strip line is excellent, and SIW excellent. And of course, this is all subjective because when you really get in the details, there's little exceptions here and there. Uh, but again, this is more of a thought process to look at the different properties and the different RF structures and see how that lines up with the circuit that you're wanting to design. Now, the far right column I think is really important, and that is how much the circuit fabrication process can impact the RF performance. So again, looking at microstrip, uh, top row, you can see that I've rated that as good, as in there is minimal impact of PCB impact, I'm sorry, there's minimal influence from PCB fabrication on a microstrip circuit in regards to RF performance. However, Grand Coplanar Waveguide is, uh, I've rated poor because there is a significant uh, difference to uh, RF performance related to circuit fabrication. And then strip line and SIW, moderate and uh, significant uh, for SIW. And the reason significant for SIW is, um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll show you that in a little more detail on the next graphic. The picture here is actually an extension of the table that I just described. And here we're looking at the four different RF structures, microstrip on the far left, ground coplanar waveguide, strip line, and SIW on the far right. SIW is an acronym for uh, substrate integrated waveguide. 
and it's used in a variety of different RF applications. Now, as I said in the last um, chart that I was looking at, the last table we're looking at, ground coplanar waveguide is probably one of the worst ones when it comes to being affected by circuit fabrication. And you can see here the influences that can affect the RF performance. And that's really what I'm showing underneath each of these RF structures is the influence circuit fabrication or material properties have on the RF performance. And it's rated uh, as in one being the most influential and then down the list. So granite coplanar waveguide that has the most influence or the circuit fabrication of granite waveguide has the most influence on RF performance. You can see it has the most influences. And then microstrip to the left that has much less influences and microstrip is not, or the performance, uh, RF performance of microstrip is not uh, impacted by uh, PCB fabrication as much. Strip line, you can see there's a list of things there, and it depends on the design pretty strongly. A lot of times strip line can be built pretty robust, and other times it's a little more difficult. Uh, but still, it's usually in the range of good for circuit fabrication and how that, and, uh, how that impacts RF performance. Far right, SIW, there's only three influences that I've listed there. Uh, but the first one is the big got you, and that is the P, uh, PTH via location. So the hull walls that defined uh, the picket fence, so to speak, on both sides uh, to make the SIW, the waveguide walls, that is extremely critical as you go up in frequency. At lower frequencies, maybe 10 gigahertz or less, SIW can be used and uh, it is not impacted by the printed circuit board fabrication influences as much as when you go to higher frequency and then the uh, accuracy of drilling these holes down these rows and side to side, that becomes much more impactful on the RF performance. So even though SIW has less influences uh, from circuit fabrication of how it affects RF performance, uh, one of these influences is really a big deal and that's item number one. For the next few graphics, it's good for the RF engineer to keep in mind uh, the field orientation within a circuit. That kind of gives you an idea of how circuit fabrication influences can impact the electrical performance of the circuit. And I'm going to use granite coplanar waveguide as an example, and I'm also going to talk about these other RF structures, but granite coplanar waveguide is a really good example for how circuit fabrication can impact RF performance because there are so many influences in circuit fabrication in making the granite coplanar waveguide. The picture shown here is a granite coplanar waveguide cross-sectional view and on top is an ideal structure. On the bottom is a more real-world structure where you have trapezoidal shaped conductors and most software will assume rectangular shaped conductors. And for granite coplanar waveguide or anything that's got a coupled feature like microstrip, edge coupled, things like that, the coupled uh, lines in the air can vary due to the uh, structure or the geometry of the uh, signal conductor and the neighboring conductors. So if you do a model on the uh, top structure where you have a lot of fields in air, and then in reality what you get is more trapezoidal shape uh, geometry on the bottom picture, you're going to have less fields in air. Less fields in air means more fields in the substrate. It's a higher dielectric constant, slower wave velocity, affects the phase angle. There's a lot of changes going on there. And uh, so that's very good for the RF engineer to consider. And it is very good to talk to the circuit fabricator and understand how much that trapezoidal shape can vary from one circuit to another. The big deal here is normally related to millimeter wave or very high frequency that's coupled. And uh, understanding the effects of this are really important, especially if you're building a circuit that's the same design and very large volume, then what's going to happen is this trapezoidal shape is going to vary from circuit to circuit. And as it varies, the coupling effects are also going to vary. So you may not get exactly the performance out of the circuit that you would expect. Again, talk to your circuit fabricator, find out how much that trapezoidal shape can vary and how much it can be controlled, and try to account for that in your RF simulations. Here is another example of granite coplanar waveguide, and here I'm looking at what I call a lip dimension, and that is in the coplanar layer, top copper layer. And essentially what it is is the distance from the ground plane to the edge of the hole that's drilled to make connection between the top ground and the bottom ground, the plated through hole. So that dimension, uh, nominally designed at whatever the number may be, maybe 10 mils, 
uh, that's going to vary plus or minus five mils or more or less depending on the circuit fabricator and again need to talk to the circuit fabricator and find out what kind of difference that means really and then have that part of the RF simulations. Now lower frequency that, geom that uh, geometry and the change in that uh, location is usually not that big of a deal. When you get into higher frequencies, millimeter wave, definitely at 60 gigahertz or more, that change in the dimension, which is normal variation of making a circuit, and it will vary from circuit to circuit, that change in the dimension will actually change the ground return path, and it's gonna make the, uh, the circuit actually perform difference for a variety of uh, RF uh, features. Another example shown here, again, ground to coplanar waveguide, and also, as I've said, this can apply to anything that's coupled, microstrip, edge coupled, things like that. But in this case, we're looking at ground to coplanar waveguide, and it's the coupling fields that we're interested in. So, as the circuit is made, the copper that we supply in our laminates has copper plated on top of it, usually. On most of the circuit uh, processing, that's how they go about making plated through holes, is plate up the copper in the holes, as well as the circuit image, too. So the final copper thickness is really what I'm talking about here. And it will vary uh, from circuit to circuit. Again, it's the same circuit design going through large volume manufacturing, and you will see differences in the copper thickness from circuit to circuit. In the case of single-ended transmission lines, not a problem. In the case of coupled features, that's where you have the issue. So in the case of a circuit that has thinner copper, which is the top circuit, you can see there's less fields in air. And in the case of the same design, but having thicker copper, uh, there's more fields in error. With more fields in error, that means the effective dielectric constant is going to be lower, and that will, of course, change the phase velocity, phase angle, and many things. So understanding what the variation could be in copper thickness is very good to do and put into your RF simulations. Again, need to talk to the circuit fabricator and really understand what should be expected for the difference of copper thickness. Shown in this graphic is a comparison between microstrip on the upper left, ground coplanar on the upper right. And I am showing electric fields blue and current density and dark red. And really what I'm trying to show here is how the different structures are impacted by a lossy plated finish. Now when you make a circuit, you cannot ship it, or normally anyway, with bare copper because copper of course tarnishes over time and bad things can happen. So normally it's covered up with solder mask or some kind of metal finish. In this case, the copper conductors are co covered with ENIG, electrous nickel immersion gold, and that will protect the conductor so it will not oxidize over time and remain good. So uh, ENIG is a very good finish and used uh, for a variety of different reasons, but it does cause more conductor losses, which in turn has to do with insertion loss. And uh, what I'm showing here on the left, the graphic on the left showing the insertion loss, I'm showing a difference between the circuit with bare copper and ENIG. Bare copper red curve, blue curve is the ENIG copper, or the ENIG finish on the copper. And you can see a difference in insertion loss out at 50 gigahertz on the far right. And the loss is about the difference of 0.5 dB per inch, which is pretty significant. Considering it's the exact same circuit, and the only difference is bare copper versus ENIG, that's pretty significant. Now when you go to the right and look at that same comparison, it's actually using the same material. And the only difference is it's now tightly coupled granted coplanar waveguide. Now the difference between bare copper curve, which is the red curve, and the curve with the ENIG, blue curve, you can see there's much bigger difference. There's 1.2 dB uh, per inch difference at 50 gigahertz. So it's obvious that granite coplanar waveguide is much more impacted, or any coupled feature is much more impacted by a lossy finish such as ENIG. Now, there are other finishes that could be used, like immersion silver. That really doesn't cause a difference in conductor loss generally. And also immersion tin, and that does cause a little difference in condu conductor loss, but not too much, mainly because it's applied so thin. And uh, this is a good comparison to keep in mind when doing RF simulations, because several times in RF simulations, uh, you can look at the conductor effects, and if you don't put in the proper numbers for the nickel and gold that's being applied, you may not get the RF performance you expect on the actual circuit as compared to the RF simulation. In summary, it's always good to talk to your circuit fabricator to understand some of the influences that we've discussed here, such as trapezoidal effects, the lip dimension, 
Uh, there's several different things to consider, final plated finishes. There's a lot of different things that the RF designer who is less familiar with PCB technology may not consider in their simulations, and it's very important to do that. So please talk to your circuit fabricator about these issues, and you can also talk to our technical support team, our TSEs, technical service engineers, and also our ADMs, application development managers. They all have a lot of experience on these topics, and they will be very good to talk to. This concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.